The movie is set in Algeria during the War of Independence. The political climate at that time had a great impact on the relationship between the main protagonist, Younes, and the love of his life. The scenes are mostly his recollections when he was young. But the memories are as sharp and clear as the waters in the harbor where he grew up. His story starts in 1939. Younz is a 10-year-old who has a poor but simple life with his father, Issa, his mother, and his younger sister. Issa owns a plot of land on which he's planted wheat. He works hard all day, and eventually, his crops have turned golden in color, which indicates a bountiful harvest and good money. But a rich proprietor wants his land. And when Issa refuses to sell his farm, the proprietor burns the land to dust. Nothing is left for Issa and his family, so he decides to move all of them into the city of Warren. Issa brings them to the slums, where the majority of the occupants are Arabs, like they are. He is deeply religious and believes that his God will provide for him and his family, as long as he works hard. But he is also a prideful man. He has a brother in the city named Mahai. He is a well-known pharmacist and belongs to the upper class of society. He and his wife, Madeline, are childless and they long to have a young one to care for. When Mahai is informed by his messenger, Bliss, about his brother's presence, he doesn't hesitate to go to them. Madeline asks him to tell Issa they are welcome at their house. But when Mahai arrives, Issa doesn't take it kindly. He is rude and indifferent to his only living relative despite Mahai's gentle approach. Perhaps Issa is insecure about how his brother has become successful in life, so he covers it with pride and religious reverence. Mahai sees Younz and the girl, and immediately embraces them like his own. But Issa grabs his children away from his brother, saying that no matter what happens, he will not part with them. Mahai attempts to make his brother see reason, but Issa doesn't listen anymore. With that, Mahai leaves in frustration and disappointment. Issa's pride is taking over his life. He works multiple jobs just to provide for his family, but it's not good. Younz, in his young mind, understands that he must take some responsibilities to lighten the burden on his father. Together with a friend, he captures Jays, puts them in a cage, and sells them. Soon, he earns enough coins and shows them to his father. But Issa's pride doesn't see Younz's sincere intention in helping him. He only sees his weakness in knowing that his son has to work, because he can't provide for him. He scolds his son hard. When he stops, Younz's mother can only comfort him and tell him to be patient. But that night, Issa realizes that he's made a fool of himself, and that Younz doesn't deserve the treatment he gave him earlier. So the next day, he brings his son to Mahai, and leaves him there. If there's anyone in his family who deserves to know how good life can be, it's Younz. The boy finds it hard to part with his father. It takes him a long time to open up to his uncle and aunt. Eventually, with Mahai's support and Madeline's gentle ministrations, he accepts this new phase in his life. But he never forgets his roots. When he has a chance, he runs back to the slums to give a doll to his sister. But he finds out that Issa has abandoned his family, and no one knows where he is. His mother pleads to him to never forget them, even when he has a good life. Younz knows the importance of promises, and gives his word to his his mother. Madeline introduces him to French culture. She christens him Jonas, which at first he doesn't like. She assists Mahai in his pharmacy, and also teaches piano lessons to kids. It is during one of her piano lessons that Jonas meets the love of his life. Emily is a sweet girl who does her best to learn the piano. When Jonas sees her for the first time, he is so tongue-tied that he can't answer one of Emily's questions. Madeline explains that Jonas is shy. The girl says it's a nice name. And that's when he finally embraces the name Madeline has given him. The next time Jonas sees Emily in the house, he tries to secretly give her a rose. The girl only smiles at this gesture, but she's happy to know that the boy likes her, too. However, Jonas's blissful life in Oren will change. The French police officers capture Mahai under suspicion of helping Arab rebels. They take him to prison for questioning. As mentioned earlier, the political climate in Algeria at this time is not stable. It's important to understand this context, as it will affect the lives of Jonas and Emily later on. Algeria has been under French colonial rule for hundreds of years. A lot of French people have been born there, and consider themselves part of the country, like Madeleine and Emily. But the Arabs have always wanted their freedom from their colonizers. During the French colonial rule, very few Arabs have been accepted into the society, like Mahai. For the most part, they are shunned or discriminated against. Many of them work as servants, and this has caused deep resentment among the nationalists. In 1939, a nationalist party was founded by Masali Hajj, but has been disbanded by the French to suppress any seeds of rebellion. Mahai was arrested because of his close ties to the party, but he's always been a pacifist and abhorred violence. However, his true nature gets overshadowed because of his political beliefs. And it doesn't make it easy on Madeline either, although she still chooses to stay with him. While he is in prison, several bombings happen near the port. Many Arabs have become victims of this tragic event. Unfortunately, Jonas's family is part of them. The kid finds this out when Mahai gets released and informs him of this tragedy. His only remembrance is the bloody doll that he gave to his sister. To avoid further complications with the French police, Mahai decides to locate his family in Rio Salado. Emily comes to say goodbye. She tries to comfort Jonas, but he's too brokenhearted by what has happened. The little family successfully transfers to Rio Salado, a small town in the countryside. 
Many of its occupants are of European descent, most of whom were born there and consider Algeria their home. But just like Oran, the town outskirts are filled with poor Arabs. Mahi manages to put up his pharmacy right in the town center. He, Madeline, and Jonas are easily welcomed there. Jonas even makes friends with Isabel, whose father owns the biggest vineyard in the country. At school, the boy easily mixes with other kids. With his handsome features, everyone thinks he's a French cherub. Until they learn his real name. His teacher calls him Jans during a roll call. The boy shyly corrects his teacher to call him Jonas. Most kids don't mind, except for those who think Arabs are not worth their attention. One of them is Jean Christophe. During their break, he tells Isabel that Jonas's real name is Jans, making it sound like the boy is lying to her. Well, kids are kids, and they think simply, despite their fullness of emotions. Isabel shouts at him for lying, and announces that she won't love him because he's an Arab. Jean Christophe is not satisfied with this. Flanked by his friends Fabris and Simon, they gang up on Jonas and chide him for lying. Jean Christophe orders Jonas to lower his head, because in his mind, the French are superior to anyone. Jonas stands his ground, which earns him a whack on his head. Fighting ensues between the boys. Later, when the teacher asks who started the fight, Jonas lies again and says no one, that he simply got his injuries by tripping and falling. He earns painful ruler swats on his hand because of this. But Jean Christophe acknowledges this valiant attempt to cover up his misdemeanor. So, during a free day, he and his friends follow Jonas near the beach. Instead of bullying him again, he thanks him for what he did. He tells him they are friends forever, which Jonas gratefully accepts. This starts a lifelong friendship between the four of them. Thirteen years have passed since this day, and they have grown into men who are well known in their town. They like to hang out at the beach, just like any other citizens. Isabel always goes with them, because she's one of the boys, and also Jean Christophe's girlfriend. Her brother, Deed, is also friends with them. He's pompous and arrogant, with strong French pride. He either flaunts his luxury items in front of his friends, or show them his superiority by a, a servant, Jellal. No one really bats an eye when he does the latter. It's ingrained in the residents of Rio Salado to always look down on Arabs. Jonas has always known this, and he feels lucky enough to have never experienced this kind of treatment. He still gets the respect his uncle Mahai gets as an esteemed pharmacist. But he's also an Arab, and he can't simply turn a blind eye toward the treatment his comrades are getting. When this happens, just like in this instance, he walks away until the coast is clear. It's at this point that he meets the alluring Madame Kaysnave sunbathing at a secluded spot on the beach. Jonas, and later the other boys who follow him, ogle at the woman and her seductive curves. They know that she's a widow who has just returned from another country. It's like there's an unspoken rule among them that Jonas will go for her. The next day, as he helps his uncle at the pharmacy, Jonas meets Madame Kaysnave again as the latter buys her medicine. In an instant, it's a mutual attraction, and the older lady boldly expresses her wishes for Jonas to come to her house. Her residence is located in the vast farmland just outside the town. It's obvious that she comes from an affluent family, and is only spending her time either looking beautiful or looking at the plantation that she has no plans to manage. It's a hot day. The madam is sweating as she sees the boy from the pharmacy arrive on his bicycle to deliver her medicine. Primo, the gruff caretaker, reluctantly lets Jonas in, because he knows what is about to happen. Inside, Madame Kaysnave uses her allure to seduce the boy, and Jonas is a willing prey to fall for it. Soon, they are tangled in the sheets, starting a sensual liaison between them. Jonas comes back to his home the next day, where he sees a French police car parked in front. There are rumors that the Nationalist Party that disbanded years ago is being revived, this time more menacing and forceful than its pacifist origin. And since Mahai has a record in Oran, the police naturally question him. Lack of evidence and his good credentials save him from getting arrested, but the police will keep an eye on him. Some residents gather around due to curiosity, but soon they disperse due to lack of drama. Life continues in Rio Salado, despite the bubbling political tension hidden under the pretense of peace. Jonas keeps coming back to the villa to have another moment with the enigmatic Madame Kaysnave, but the lady puts a stop to their liaison. Despite her mundane wants, she's wise enough to know that this relationship will go nowhere. She's right when she says Jonas only desires her, not loves her. But it gives her immense pleasure to know that a young man wants her like before. Meanwhile, back in town, Deed comes back from America, showing off his new car model. He has bought a good building right at the center of the town, and plans to turn it into an American diner. He even brings a jukebox, to emulate the American feel. Then he orders Jellal to fix it for him. The latter bravely answers back, saying he's not an electrician. Only Fabris shows small support for this gesture, but everyone else is surprised at the Arab's feistiness. Poor Jalal gets dragged into the back of the building and receives a whipping from Deed. Soon, Jalal promises, his abusive boss will have his comeuppance. Deed has always wanted to start his own restaurant. His father, Mr. Rusilio, is disappointed about this. He has no choice but to train his daughter, Isabel, about their business and their land. Eventually, he learns to accept Deed's passion, when he visits the restaurant that's about to be completed. And the next night, the whole town witnesses its extravagant opening. 
Rondellas are playing the big hits from the American radio waves, and people are liking and dancing to the fun tunes. Jean Christophe, Jonas, Fabris, and Simon are all there to support their friend. Everything goes well, until the arrival of one lady that will turn their worlds upside down. A woman walks into the crowd and takes a seat in the corner. She is dressed like everyone else, but it's her red lips that take the attention. She has an alluring aura that blends perfectly with the innocence in her big blue eyes. The four friends are mesmerized just looking at her. But she is only looking at one man. At Jonas. And he takes this signal. He walks to the lady and tells her sweet words. But in fact, all the lady wants is a dance from him. So Jonas guides her to the dance floor, where the lady tells her who she is. She is Emily, and she has come to live here after her study abroad. Jonas is so happy to see his childhood sweetheart. Sparks of attraction fly between them, just like before. But their moment gets interrupted when Deed signals the start of the fireworks show. Everyone is in awe at the beautiful lights against the dark sky, including Emily. But Jonas is more dazzled by her beauty. To his sorrow, she's gone after the show. The next day, Simon gathers his friends in urgency. He claims to know the address of the lady from last night. On their way, they shout to each other, until she's somebody's, she's everybody's. Jonas feels more and more cautious as they head toward the grand villa located just outside town. To his trepidation, they all find out that Emily is Madame Kaysnave's only daughter. The mother welcomes the five young men to her home, while her daughter prepares some snacks for them. To each one, Madame Kaysnave asks what they plan to do in life. Fabris is set to be a reporter in Oren, Simon dreams of becoming a fashion designer, and Deed has his restaurant to take care of. Jean Christophe says he doesn't know yet what he'll do. When she turns to Jonas, she pretends not to know him and asks the question. But before he can answer, Emily returns with the biscuits and tells everyone that she knows Jonas from years before. It's clear on her face that she likes him, but she is oblivious to the alarm on her mother's face. Later, when everyone looks out at the vast farmland, Emily invites Jonas to meet her at the library tomorrow at 3 p.m. Unbeknownst to her, Madame Kaysnave hears this. The next day, Jonas walks towards the library. He hesitates at the door, not sure if this is the right thing to do. But before he can enter, Madame Kaysnave approaches him and asks him to follow her. They enter a church. There, the woman pleads with Jonas not to sleep with her daughter. If he proceeds with courting Emily, the madam will tell her daughter everything that has happened between them. Jonas starts to see the conceited woman behind the alluring smile. But for both their sakes, he swears not to form any relationship with Emily. He goes home, depressed, only to find Emily playing the piano just like before. But he doesn't go near her, nor give her any attention. He is good to his word, even if it means avoiding her will break his heart to pieces. Since then, he makes sure not to allow Emily any chance for a romance between them. He is still civil with her, but his cold attitude toward her makes everyone confused, including Emily. Everyone can see that he has feelings for her. She does everything to make Jonas jealous, like getting close to his friends. But Jonas is skilled at keeping his emotions inside. While they're hanging out at Deed's restaurant, she sneakily touches his leg. But still, no big reaction from him. Then one of the waiters comes to him to tell him about Jellal. He's at the back of the restaurant, bloodied from Deed's beatings. The servant vows to take revenge on his boss. Jonas can only give him pocket money to move on, telling him not to come back. Jellal takes this advice and leaves the restaurant. A few days pass, and everyone is surprised to see Jean Christophe and Emily together at the cinema. It turns out Jean Christophe left Isabel to have his chance at Emily. But everyone knows she's only leading him on to make Jonas jealous. Outside the cinema, Emily confronts Jonas. Why does she have to do all these things, make herself cheap just to get his attention, when everyone knows they both have feelings for each other? She grabs his hand and puts it on her chest, showing him her heart only beats for him. But as usual, Jonas is insufferable with his silence. Unfortunately, Jean Christophe sees this and thinks Jonas is groping her. He hits his friend, then curses Emily for making a fool out of him. He spits at Jonas before leaving them. Because of this incident, Jonas decides to leave for the capital, Algiers. He wants to be a pharmacist, just like his uncle. And the distance will surely make him forget his feelings for Emily. The next day, as he heads toward the bus stop, she approaches him to tell him that Jean Christophe is missing. No one knows where he is. But that's none of his concern, Jonas says. Emily retaliates that she only did what she did to make him jealous, but Jonas just shrugs her off. As he's about to ride the bus, Isabel comes to them with the grim news about Jean Christophe. He's joined the military, and he's set to sail for Saigon the next day. She blames Jonas and Emily for everything. Emily apologizes, but Jonas simply accepts this fact and rides the bus. He leaves Emily in tears. Is it really his fault, why all these things happened? Surely, Emily has made the mistake of stringing along his friend but only because she doesn't know the true reason for his behavior toward her. Jonas understands that all this started when he gave in to his carnal pleasures with Madame Kaysnave. Had he known that she was the mother of the only woman he loves, he would have restrained himself. He could have had a happy relationship with Emily, and perhaps even marry her and take her to Algiers. On the other hand, he is still unsure whether keeping everything from her is the right thing to do. If he takes the risk, will Emily still accept and love him? Could he have his chance, if he takes the courage to get the woman he loves? Four years have passed since he left Rio Salado. 
Many things have changed since. Jean Christophe reconnects with Isabel and apologizes for hurting her. Simon has put up the first boutique in the town. Fabris is a successful reporter and is about to get married. Emily has taken over the library, and Jonas is offered a job at one of the big pharmaceutical companies. But an unfortunate incident makes him come back to Rio Salado. His uncle Mahai has suffered a heart attack and is now hospitalized. He has to return to manage the pharmacy, but he makes sure to visit his uncle, to whom he owes a lifetime of gratitude for taking him in. Once he's settled again in town, he visits the library where Emily works. The spark is still there after all these years. Jonas is grateful to see her again. There is hope in her eyes, although she's more reserved than before. She recommends he read a book about a man who is loved by everyone, but unable to love. Perhaps, with that, there may be a chance that he'll finally take the courage to go for her. A few days later, Jean Christophe returns. The friends have their reunion at the Rusilio residence. Jean Christophe has become a decorated soldier due to his service to the country, but he still hasn't forgotten the offense Jonas committed before. The latter tries to explain, but the soldier has closed his ears. For the sake of their peaceful reunion, the two men set aside their differences and sit at the round table. There, Jean Christophe announces his engagement with Isabel. Everyone celebrates this expected union, but what they don't expect is another engagement announcement. This time, coming from Emily and Simon. Apparently, Madame Kaysnave has forced her daughter into this union. Jonas is devastated, and Emily is resigned. One can only feel immense disappointment and sadness at this turn of events. To Jonas's consolation, he knows that Simon loves her and will take care of her. Later that day, two important things happen that drive the story of our protagonist. First, Jellal, who's been laying low after leaving the restaurant, is now recruiting members for a hidden nationalist group. The movement for Algeria's independence is getting stronger, and the nationalists need more forces to drive out their conquerors. Second, Emily finally confronts Jonas about whatever relationship they have. She's still holding on to the tiny hope that he'll finally love her back. He only needs to say the words, and she'll cancel the wedding. But Jonas keeps his mouth closed. Whether because he's still keeping his promise to Madame Kaysnave, or he doesn't want to hurt Emily with the truth, Jonas coldly pushes her away, burying his love for her. Poor Emily feels her love become hate. She tells him that he's the worst thing that ever happened to her, before leaving him for the last time. The wedding pushes through, with only Jonas feeling sorrowful among the happy guests. Perhaps he's thinking about what could have been, if only the past mistakes hadn't made his decisions too heavy. Things don't improve, as only a few days later, Mahai passes away. And just a day later, Algeria's War of Independence starts. Jonas mourns for many things, one of which is that his uncle never saw the day his brethren raised their arms for their freedom. The war spans for several years, during which French residents are being harassed to leave the country. Those who choose to stay have no choice but to guard themselves against people that they consider rebels. Some Arabs are loyal to their employers, and have taken the duty to protect them. For example, Cremo stays alert for any sign of violence to protect Emily, Simon, and their little son. But for some French, they are more than willing to leave the country, like Madame Kaysnave. Before crossing the border, she makes one last stop at Jonas's pharmacy. After all these years, she's recognizing her part in making her daughters and Jonas's lives miserable. If things had been different, she would have approved Jonas for Emily. But her words mean no more to him. His cold demeanor toward her speaks volumes. The war never relents, but the citizens of Rio Salado try to live their lives as normally as possible. The Rusilio family even decides to throw a party. It's to send a message to the rebels that the French will stay strong in their places. However, he's also preparing for an attack from them at any time. One night, Jonas and Madeline get raided by the rebels, led by Jellal. Jonas feels a certain duty to help his brethren, but it's Madeline who shows genuine kindness towards them, although these very people are trying to force her out of the country she calls home. In the morning, Jonas brings Jellal back to their base, with the promise of not revealing their hideout to the French. But this costs him his freedom, as Cremo points at him at one of the checkpoints. Jonas gets detained for helping the rebels. Emily finds out about this, and she can't help but ask her husband to help him. But Simon gets angry at this, saying he'd help even without her asking. The silence that passes between them says all the untold hurt, for their marriage is only one-sided on his part. Emily has never forgotten her love for Jonas. Fortunately, Mr. Rusilio bails Jonas out. He brings him to one part of his farm. He gestures toward it, and tries to convince Jonas that the rebels are the ones damaging the lands, and that the French are only saving and cultivating what the earth can give. But Jonas says his ancestors were content and happy with what they had, until the foreigners came and pillaged what wasn't theirs. The lands don't belong to the French, and that's that. Mr. Rusilio is dismayed, and leaves Jonas there. The war continues, raising the number of casualties on each side. Even Emily and her family are not safe from the attacks. Jonas sees the fire in her home from his balcony and rushes to save her. Emily and her son are safe, but not Simon, who lies on the ground lifeless, with his throat slit. Cremo pushes him away, despite offering help, and Emily angrily tells him to go away. Even at his friend's funeral, Jonas is not allowed. All he can do is what he does best, keep his emotions to himself and silently mourn. 
The nationalists continue pushing the French out of their country. The once lively town of Rio Salado is now bearing the vestiges of the nationalists' bloody fight for their independence. Until, eventually, French Algeria is no more, and a new Algeria is born. The celebrations that follow last for several days. Many Arabs come out of their poor homes and rally in the streets, waving their country's flag. The last population of French people is now being deported to their country of origin. Among them are Emily and her son. With his connection with Jalal and Isabel's information, Jonas catches up with Emily to offer her home and protection by his side. But her heart has already hardened toward him. This country has taken so much from her. She tells him that it's over between them, something that never really began. After this, Jonas spends the rest of his life in Rio Salado, serving his people as a pharmacist. But he never married, for there's only one woman in his heart. Sometimes he travels to France to watch over her and her son Mitchell, but he never dares to get close. In 2010, Jonas meets with a grown Mitchell. The man invites him to meet his old friends who are expecting to see him. But Jonas declines the offer. Instead, he wishes to visit the grave of Emily. She just recently passed away, and Jonas found out through her son. Mitchell gives him the letter her mother wrote in her final days. Then he leaves. When Jonas opens it, he sees the first rose he gave her when they were young. Tears fill his eyes as he reads Emily's letter. It says that she regrets the way she reproached him before. But despite what happened, she's forgiven him, so she asks for his forgiveness. She'll always love him. Jonas puts the letter down, kneels, and finally says the words he'd always wanted to tell her. It seems like the day for forgiveness and closure, because to his surprise, Jean Christophe approaches him. The once proud soldier is now humble. He realizes that time doesn't heal the wounds, but only dulls the pain, enough for him to let forgiveness in. He forgives Jonas, and says they'll always be friends. Then he points out the letter that's about to be blown away. Jonas runs to it and catches it in time. He looks up and sees that he's back at the Rio Salado which he once knew. He sees all the characters that have made a mark in his life. But he only has eyes for one. Emily stands a few feet away, waiting for him to take her hand. She's as beautiful as the first time he saw her again. Perhaps, in another lifetime, they can finally have the love that should have been.